Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to this Tuesday, April 10th, Market Watchers Live Show with your hosts, Tom Boley and Aaron Swinland. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. And for our regulars, welcome back. Uh, we've got a good day so far in the market. You can see the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 475 points, threatening 24,500, which would be its highest level in about three to four weeks. The S&P 500 challenging its 20-day moving average up 45 points today. The NASDAQ uh, also moving higher, but maybe lagging a bit on a relative basis, still up 118 points today. And the Russell 2000 challenging both of its key moving averages and price resistance up 25 points today. The 10-year Treasury yield up one basis point to about 2.80%. Volatility index continues to move a bit lower. Big news today is energy. Uh, the crude oil prices are up. I've been talking about a little bit of a disconnect there, but energy starting to make a rebound, perhaps closing the gap with the crude oil prices. We'll talk about this later in the show. But as you can see, the XLE taking out a big level at 69. Autos having a nice day today. Uh, there was some news overnight in terms of uh, China reducing some of the tariffs on autos. And as a result, the auto index doing well, continuing its April push to the upside. Commercial vehicles and trucks having a nice day, but still a little bit of overhead resistance at that declining 20-day moving average. Uh, equipment, or excuse me, oil equipment and services. Uh, this is a big part of the energy space, up about 4% today. And you can see the overhead resistance just around the 420 level. So a breakout there would be very bullish. I wrote about the tires index. There is a nice positive divergence under this group. And we're seeing a really strong move today on the tires. And then finally, the top performer in the S&P 500 today goes to Seagate Technology. Uh, the stock is up nicely, trying to make a breakout here. I do want to point out, though, that eight of the 10 best performing stocks in the S&P 500, it's in that they're in the uh, energy space. So clearly, energy is the uh, topic of the day. And with that, let me bring in my co-host, Aaron. How are you doing, Aaron? I'm doing quite well, trying to stay cool considering my air conditioner compressor just went out and yesterday's high was 94. So it wow. uh, will probably be a little warm today uh, as, as it gets going. And, and here's hoping the AC man can get here or woman can get here in time for uh, I, by about one or two, it's going to be pretty miserable in here. Yeah. I know when I went uh, away for vacation for a week, I went down to Florida. It seemed like right before that we were talking about really cool weather. Um, and I know you had had some cool weather out on the West Coast as well, but it sounds like that's uh, that's over. A <laughs> <laughs> that. Yes, it's it's spring, actually kind of winter, spring, and then it's summer. Hello. <laughs> it's starting to warm up here on the East Coast as well. In the Southeast, I'm in South Carolina. Things are supposed to get a lot warmer this weekend. So that brings in Bill Shelby from Stock Charts, who's up in the upper Northwest in Seattle. What do you, how are things going out there, Bill? Ah, it's uh, breaking news that it's raining. <laughs> shocker, shocker right there. Yep, I'll just leave it there. We got rain for the foreseeable future. Had a nice day yesterday, but we've snapped back to the mean. Oh, dear. Uh, you got weather wars still going on in uh, Seattle. We got trade wars in the, in the market. You got weather wars. <laughs> Anyhow, well, Bill will be with us here in just a few minutes. He's got some tips and tricks at Stock Charts. Can't wait to see those. So hang around if you don't mind, Bill, for about 10 minutes, and we'll get back to you. All right, Aaron, why don't you get into the schedule and the agenda, and we'll get this whole thing going. Yes, let's get it going. So tomorrow, I'm happy to announce my father, Carl Swindlin, will be in to talk to us probably more about the intermediate term. I haven't seen his charts yet, but they're always interesting. It's not and your birthday again, is it? No, I actually was able to talk him into coming on, and it didn't have to be my birthday. So. Okay. I know last time he came in to celebrate your birthday with us. Exactly. I think he found out it wasn't so bad. <laughs> so he was willing to come back. So, And then Friday, I have my workshop. I think I'm going to be doing it on divergences and confirmations. So that should uh, hopefully be interesting to a few people. So today we are. We're going to start with everything stock charts and Bill Shelby right after our technical headlines. Momentum sleepers. We're going to take a look at a few that, uh, you know, with the market kind of turning around, I think there's some interesting charts. 10 and 10 to 1. Our first symbol is going to be Merck, M-R-K. And then finally, we're going to do what would you do at the end. And if you want to go take the what would you do poll, it is right there to the right of the viewer, the live stream viewer. 
So with that, let's go ahead and move on to those technical headlines. Sounds good. I uh, had a couple of economic reports out this morning. At 8.30, March PPI came out, rose 0.3%. Uh, the market was only anticipating a rise of 0.1%. And then the March core PPI came in also at a rise of 0.3%. Market was looking for a rise of 0.2%. So uh, the inflation at the producer level did come in a little hotter than expected. And I'm wondering, you know, in the back of my mind, you know, it's been this whole fear about trade and potential trade war. And I'm wondering if that uh, might move on to inflation. We'll have to wait and see how the CPI comes out later in the week. Uh, February wholesale inventories were out at 10 a.m. They rose 1% versus 1.1% uh, expected. And that's a series, you know, this is a string of pretty solid reports on wholesale inventories. And I'm wondering if this is going to be a precursor to a better than expected GDP report, first quarter GDP, when we get that later in the month, it will be uh, certainly something to keep in mind and to watch. The uh, last part of this would be the March wholesale inventories. And with all the tariffs being announced, you have to wonder whether or not a lot of the steel and aluminum and so forth, whether there was some stockpiling going on in March ahead of uh, possible you know, tariffs and that and so forth. So we could have a bigger, I mean, this could be one sign of a bigger GDP number than expected, uh, but we'll have to see. Uh, they, when I looked at the February wholesale inventories, they did revise January one-tenth higher. So even though we came in one-tenth lower than expected in February, kind of made up for it in January. So last few few months have been very strong with the month-over-month uh, -month wholesale inventory numbers. Uh, but taking a look at the 10-year Treasury yield here, you can see we've been mostly flat. And while we did break out of that 280 to 295 range that we were looking at for about five or six weeks, we went down just into the lower 270s. We've worked our way back to that 280 number, and that's just about where we're sitting right now. Uh, so we'll see whether or not we can begin to strengthen. Of course, anytime you see the yield rising, that means money is coming out of the bond market. And so if we do see a breakout above last week's high, say above 284, I think that could translate into more money rotating into stocks. And of course, the stock market right now is still looking for a catalyst to kind of get it back on track. And uh, money rotating away from bonds certainly could be that uh, catalyst. Facebook in the news. Of course, it's been in the news a lot lately. The, uh, their CEO, Mark Zuckerberg, will be testifying at 2.15 Eastern Standard Time this afternoon before the Senate Commerce, Science, and Tran Transportation Committees. Um, of course, you know, all of the privacy issues there. Um, hard to say what Facebook may do with all of this going on. But uh, you can see right now it is still struggling below its declining 20-day moving average. And even though it seems to have slowed the pace of its decline, I kind of look at this as a uh, flagpole and then a little bit of flag action. Until we get a move back through that 20-day moving average, I'd be really careful with Facebook here. Um, but the big news today and what I really want to talk about is the XLE and energy. Here you can see for the past 10 weeks or so, uh, we have been sideways consolidating mostly between 66 and 69. Today you can see this is a very clear breakout unless we get a big reversal. I don't want to see a long tail up above 70 with a close back below 69. I think that could be very bearish in the near term. But in, barring that reversal, I think this is a bullish move. And the big reason why is if you look at the crude oil prices, WTIC, dollar sign WTIC, that's the light crude oil. Here you can see, well, it doesn't give today's action, but today it was up 2% earlier this morning. Uh, so it was back up to about $65 a barrel. I think it was maybe... When I wrote my blog this morning, I think it was around 64.70 per barrel. But you can see on this chart how crude oil is, you know, we had a double top. We went all the way back up to where we were in January just a couple of weeks ago. But if we go back to the XLE, we don't see that same type of behavior. So I want to point out something. I want you to take a look at this chart. I'm going to go back on the XLE and I want to use the correlation indicator. Um, and let's take a look. The uh, default is the S&P 500, but I've got the S&P, yes. and I want to compare it to, or excuse me, I've got the XLE, and I want to compare it to crude oil prices. And let's just uh, make that a little bit bigger. And I've got the weekly, and let's go back and take a look for the last 10 years. Now, I want you just to look at the correlation between, this is the XLE on top. Here is the, well, I don't have the crude oil prices, but here's the correlation 
between the XLE and crude oil prices. And you can see that going back the last 10 years, we tend to stay very positively correlated between these two. In other words, they tend to move in the same direction. We've had a couple of dips where we have very short-lived um, inverse correlation, but for the most part, we have very positive correlation between this, you know, these two areas. And so when you take a look again, going back to the crude oil prices, and with the move today, we're probably up closer to 65. I don't know exactly where we are, but we're not far from breaking out. And then you look at the XLE. And another way to look at this, by the way, is um, let me let me go back to that uh, WTIC chart. And I'm going to add the XLE down below here. If you go to the price window, price indicator, you can put in the XLE. And instead of putting it below, I'm going to put it behind the price. And I'm going to shade it pink. And I just used a uh, solid thick line. But I want you can kind of look at this chart. And I think C, well, that's all right. I got the wrong one. XLE, or that needs to be the XLE. Let's try this again. Okay, so if you look at this chart, you can kind of see that the two tend to go hand in hand, but all of a sudden, these last couple of months, the uh, crude oil prices have stayed up near the high, but the XLE has dropped and has been in this trading range. Now, this doesn't show today's move on the XLE moving back up and breaking out, but you can see this is a pretty significant difference. Um, and so now, all of a sudden, we're getting this breakout on the XLE. And because crude oil prices have been so high, I think this is the start of maybe a little catch up. So I look for the XLE to begin to outperform the uh, crude oil prices and maybe make a move back up eventually toward that 77 to 78 level, which we saw back in January. And that would coincide with what we're seeing in crude oil prices. So I wanted to point that out. I think that's a really important part of the market to keep an eye on. Uh, autos, We've talked about the April seasonality, which is just crazy. Look at what the autos have done since the beginning of the month. Now, we did finish March on this update at about 192 or 193. We're now at 207 on the autos. So we have moved probably about 7% already in the month of April. And if you haven't been tuning into the show or you haven't seen us talk about the seasonality of autos, I want you to check out this chart. I know it's a refresher for many of you. Just bear with me. 9% is the average April return over the last 19 years. And you look across here and everything else just kind of offsets the rest of the year. In fact, the rest of the year is a minus about 5%. But for whatever reason, April tends to be a very, very strong period for autos. And here we go again. It's, uh, you know, as Yogi Berra would say, it's deja vu all over again. Um, last uh, index chart that I wanted to show you is the tire index. And I mentioned this one in my blog this morning, but first, no, I don't want the seasonality. First, let's take a look at the uh, daily chart. And you can see we're breaking back up above the 20 day moving average. Really important though, to see the lower prices as we keep going lower and lower, look at the PPO starting to turn higher. So we've got a positive divergence. It's telling us that the selling momentum to the downside is slowing. And what I normally look for is a 50 period test and a centerline test. So we've still got room here on the, the tires index. And if I pull up the weekly chart, you'll see that at the low here at 90 that we just hit, that was a multi-year low. We have not had a close on a weekly basis below 90 over the last three years. And so we went right down to 90, had the positive divergence on the daily chart, and now we're starting to bounce. The 20-week uh, uh, moving average, which during any kind of uh, move to the downside with the weekly PPO, you would expect the 20 week to provide some resistance. Also, you've got a little bit of price resistance coming in at about 101 or so, and that 20 week continues to drop. I think this has got this uh, index has a little bit more room to the upside before it's going to have a more significant technical test above. A couple of uh, stocks in the news with upgrades. Nvidia got an upgrade today. You can see the stocks performing well today, up about four and a half percent, but it still does have overhead price resistance and the 20 day moving average to deal with. Uh, STX, Seagate Technologies, I mentioned earlier, this uh, was the best performing stock in the S&P 500. It has pulled back some, so it may not be at this point, but still with an upgrade, trying to make a serious breakout here. Uh, Alta, 
was upgraded. Uh, this is a stock that had struggled for a while. It looks like it's finally starting to maybe bottom. We've had multiple bottoms down here in the low uh, 190s. And now we're back up trying to take out this high around 221, 222. Alta seems to be gaining some strength. And I think this is a company that might like the spring seasonality. Let me just check this, then we'll bring Bill in. Uh, well, March was a really strong month. 91% of the time it goes up in March. But look at these numbers coming across here, April, May, and June. Uh, this is a very strong period of the year for Alta. So it's getting an upgrade today, starting to look a little bit better on the, in, on the charts. And then, of course, the seasonality supports a continuing move to the upside. So we'll see how all that uh, unfolds. But with that, uh, we do want to move on to everything stock charts. This is an exciting segment where we do find out a lot of tips and tricks on how you can better use the stock charts website. And for that, we have brought in none other than Bill Shelby. How are you doing, Bill? Good. How are you guys doing? We are just having a blast. I was on vacation last week, but I'm getting back into the swing of things and the market, of course, is about the same as when I left. You know, it goes up 400, down 400, back up 400. I, I don't know what to make of it. Yeah, it's kind of crazy to try and uh, to pick when you want to get on or off the bus at this point. I'm just kind of, I'm sheltering in place. Yeah, are you, uh, is that one of the tips and tricks you're going to show us today, when to yeah. buy? How to keep your head under the parapet and wait for <laughs> all the dust to settle. <laughs> uh, what do you got for us? I'm going to go over annotations. Um, it's something that everybody sees you and Aaron, as well as uh, all the commentators, um, uh, use these all the time for charts. Um, maybe some people haven't played with them as much, so we're going to do a very high level. There's so many of them, we can't really cover them in depth. But we're going to go through to just how to start up the annotations, look at the toolbars and the settings. We'll go through as many of the uh, individual tools as we can, again, probably at a fairly high level, kind of quickly. And then I'll show you some uh, keyboard tips and tricks on how to do some uh, some special little features with uh, with some of the annotations. All right, sounds good. All right, so everybody's familiar with our workbench, and I just brought up a, a random stock here this morning. And we can get to the annotation tool by scrolling down. And we have this toolbar here on the very far left corner we can annotate and click that when we do that we get uh two little toolbars we get a bar on the top which has a number of settings for the tools themselves i can see line widths and styles corners uh font controls these are sorts of things that control the look and the feel of the individual annotations we have our color picker which we'll go into a little bit more later and we've got your most recently used colors so if you use a specific set of colors over and over you can very quickly attach a color to something. You'll notice that uh, as we go through the tools, this toolbar will change up here to the context of whichever tool we're using. So obviously we're drawing a trend line. We don't need to see the font size, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you, as we go through the tools, you'll see that the toolbar on top, the settings will change to be specific to what that tool can be used for. And so might as well dive right in. The section over here, we've got the ability to select our tools. We'll get into that, obviously. We've got lines here, text, basic shapes, studies. These are a little bit more complicated, and some of them use the underlying data to draw, make the drawings, so we'll get into those. And then we've got just more of the general controls. You'll see this is how to save a chart. Um, this will turn red if you haven't saved it yet, so you need to, you've basically had unsaved work. This is an undo feature here, if you like to just back through what you've done. If you like to just delete everything, and I'll be using that a bit because I'll be messing up, the, messing up the chart and it's easier for me to just blast everything and start from scratch than to undo everything, you can just delete everything. And then we'll have a help screen here. This will uh, show us a lot of the um, tips and tricks I'm going to be talking about. We'll be going through them a little quick, so if, if you can't remember, was it Control or Shift that he did? Um, this uh, dialog box here, which we'll show in a few minutes, uh, we'll, we'll show you all of those. So we'll get started. Um, trend line is one of the most popular. It's pretty much just drag and drop, these sorts of things. You can then move them around. You can grab the high handles and move here. Um, one of our first tricks is if you hold the shift key down and click, you can toggle the heads. You can see up here our menu will change as well for our menu state, just to turn that on or off. A lot of times what we'll do, we can go back and select 
is we'll say we'll want to create a trend line for a section. So instead of trying to make two perfectly parallel lines and then drawing a second one, we can basically duplicate this. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. We can go here and we can hit, um, in my case, I'm on a Mac. So I'll be saying command. If you're on a Windows machine, it will be control. We can hit command D, which is duplicate. We can create an exact copy of this line, same angles. It takes a little bit of practice, but if you hold the command key down and drag, you can create another copy. Again, this takes a little bit of practice to kind of get the timing right. We can go back and undo to back out of that. Command Z is also a keyboard shortcut for undoing. We can go back there. If we hold the command key down and draw and drag one of our handles, we'll create a perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical line. If you want to make sure it's absolutely perfect, I call this the Greg Schnell feature because when we I was creating this feature, it was not quite working properly for a long time, and Greg would uh, let me know every every uh, release that I still hadn't got it right. <laughs> I think I've finally gotten it right. Um, so that'll allow you to create perfect perfect shapes. I'll hit my delete here. We'll clean up our palette. The rest of these horizontal and vertical lines are pretty much exactly what you would suspect. They just drag with no ability to change the height or the width. You just basically can uh, drag them up and down. You'll see on the on the left there, you can get the the exact number. And then when you let up, it'll disappear. But when you're dragging, you can get the value. Up here, we can change the line styles. We can change the thickness. We can change the color by simply clicking on our color control. We've got support and resistance, which is red and green, showing when the price is above or below a line. I know that this is a popular one. A lot of people use this, so people are probably familiar with this guy. And our final line is a parabola. And this is one of the few, we have two or three tools that are created by multiple clicks. So you click three times and then it will fill out the parabola. You can drag any portion of this control so here, the three points, and we'll redo the parabola based on those, those values there. Moving on to the text, another couple of popular ones are the text notes. We can basically here start uh, just typing text. We can move this here. We've got sort of a transparent background. We can control the size of the box, which doesn't matter much now because it's a relatively short string of text, but it, it will control where the, the text is wrapped. We can increase our font size. And you see, we'll eventually start to wrap. We can make it bold. Move the font back down. We move these all over wherever we want. Um, normally, in most cases, the annotation will be stuck to the date. So as the time moves on, obviously everything on the left of the chart will slowly move to the left. It will eventually fall off the edge and you won't see it. If you'd like to keep it in place, you can use this pin button up here. And that means now that that particular item will always stay in this. So essentially, the chart will now flow underneath this and this piece this text note will stay in the same spot every time. That's uh, using the pin. Not all of the annotations uh, are allowed to be pinned. So again, if it's available, it will show up on the menu. The call outs are a little bit different. Uh, they can be used for a number of things. One of the things I use them for is just to keep track of when I've bought something. So I may do something like this. I'll say, okay, I've bought 100 shares. I'll actually decrease my font size. Put this over here, and then we can con use the control, or in the nice case, the command button to drag on a handle, and we can create the callout pointer, and this will snap to the nearest location on the box. So what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I bought 100 shares here, and I'll use this to just track my trade. And as I buy and sell, I'll just create these little callouts to remind me sort of where I've put in buys and sells. Another thing I use this for, um, because I don't have a lot of time to pay attention to what's going on. I'm so busy working with other things that I can't keep an eye on the market.
I'll use this to remind myself of uh, important things. And I'll pin that there. So because obviously earnings is something that can cause a huge variation in price. And if I want to be aware that I need to maybe think about getting out of something before earnings, or maybe I want to buy some insurance, whatever, this is just a great way for me that I use personally to just remind myself that, you know, we are coming up on earnings. We're going to be seeing that over the next few weeks. So it's something I need to really be aware of if I'm holding something that's an individual stock as opposed to XLE as an ETF. We've got the, just the little arrows. Those are just probably the most basic control. We've got a price, which will create a little mini call out box with the price at wherever you typed it or clicked it. We've got a percentage change set of bars that will tell you the percentage difference between two levels. And for this next one is going to take a bit of space. So I'm going to go clear everything off again. And this is whole section here is devoted to Elliott Wave. And we could probably spend an entire session on Elliott Wave. And I don't purport to know much of anything about Elliott Waves. But we've got all of the various cycles and um, super cycles. And essentially, you just this is another multi-click section. You can just successive clicks will walk you through the Elliott Wave series. So if you're into Elliott Waves and you know all about Elliott Waves, you can use this to just walk through and click the locations of the, the next wave and be able to plot that. And we'll get into shapes, rectangles, fairly straightforward. You can drag the directions anywhere you want. Again, this is one of the ones that has a shortcut. If you hold the shift key down on this, you can create a perfect square that's always going to be the exact same size on any side. If you want to go free form, you can, of course, go and drag it to wherever you like. If you hold your command or control key down on these corners, you can rotate it. I know Arthur will use this to sort of highlight a channel. You can go here again. Another th thing we can do is we can fill the box. Now, obviously, that's not particularly useful. So if we go up to our color control, not only can we choose our color, but we can choose the transparency of this control here. So we can make that slightly more transparent. And uh, I know from having done Arthur's show webinars a couple of years ago, Arthur will often use this to sort of show where maybe an area of resistance is or support. And maybe this is something that in the middle of that um, period there where GE was around the $17 range, we could mark this and say, well, if we fall out of this box, then we've got problems. Of course, we did fall out of that box in uh, late January on strong volume. So that might be just a way to, to mark an area of support or an area that you uh, have a particular interest in. And going back, our next one is an ellipse, which is also can be a circle. If we, same sort of thing, if we hold the shift key, we can drag and create a perfect circle. We can change our color. Go back and highlight, change our color, or we can go back to moving it into whatever shape we want. Triangle is another one of our multi-click creations. So we click three separate points, and we have our uh, our triangle there. And we'll reselect it here. We can duplicate it again by dragging clicking control and dragging a corner and uh, on our rectangle another I believe we can create is if we hold down the control while we create the, the triangle or the uh, rectangle while we're creating it it will automatically fill it we can also round the corners on the uh, rectangles which is kind of hard to see when it's selected because of the uh, control points there but you can see here when it's not selected you can have rounded corners and switch those and I'll clear us again now we get into the studies and there's a lot of these and these are a little bit more specific to the data themselves so one of the fairly common ones is the Fibonacci I'll change this to a little bit darker color we've got our lines here we'll get our actual calculations based on the underlying data these numbers over here this is another one that has a, a keyboard um, shortcut with it if you take this and you use the command key, you'll notice that 
we get an extra set we'll have to scrunch this down to get the top one there we go we have 160 shows up as well as this 23 we can again click and drag to increase or decrease the number of fibonacci lines there and we go through some more of these we have quadrant lines again these are specific to the data underneath as we drag this you'll note that the values are recalculated based on the underlying data fibonacci arcs fibonacci arc is another one if we hold down the command and drag we'll get that fourth inner circle there it just disappeared and reappeared fibonacci time zones these are set there's static and so they will always be the same number of periods if we scroll down we can see it's maybe a little hard to see but you can see the numbers here 21 34 55 so these are at preset locations they'll always be that way you can really only just drag the primary end point here if you want customizable lines you'll notice as well that as i scroll this control stays in place so if I had a really tall chart. I can scroll all the way to the bottom and I have to go all the way back to the top to reselect something. Cycle lines let you do the same, similar sorts of things to the Fibonacci, although these are user defined, so you can drag them to whatever length you want. Again, hard to see on this display. You can see the, the number of periods down here at the bottom. You can control that to wherever you want. You can move these to wherever you want. It's a little bit more control than the Fibonacci. Again, all these are, we'll put a lot of drawing on the screen there. I'll just get rid of those. Cycle circles are very similar. You can just drag the size wherever you want. Create. I always think this looks like Homer Simpson. That's Homer's head. You can drag these anywhere you want to identify various cycles. We've got sine waves. You can drive, drag those wherever you want. You can change the amplitude and the frequency. Then we can get into more of the data tools. The RAF regression channel is just a linear regression. Again, it recalculates based on the data underneath. So you'll see the size change based on the, the, the distance between the top and the lowest bar, as well as the angle of the uh, price in terms of the regression line. This is one, Tom, you were talking about earlier. This is another three-point creation tool, the Andrews Pitchfork. You can create three clicks, and once it's get the third click, we draw the tool. You can then change all sorts of various options and directions of the pitchfork. Fibonacci Fan is another Fibonacci that we can hold the shift key down. Or the, excuse me, the command key. Actually, we'll go and start over these are getting a little messy you can get that fourth line there if we hold the command key down for the Fibonacci's a newest one this is one of the ones we've just recently added we were working with Scott Carney he was on the show maybe a month ago it's called XABCD this is a five point creation tool so we can click this allows us to get the XABCD process and usually this is transparent so I'll go back up to my sort of a transparent color here to let us see the values underneath and if you listen to his uh, presentation you can and uh, look at some of the harmonics you can position these points on the chart to show specific points of resistance and uh, buy points, sell points. Um, we've got some ratios here. Uh, I'll def defer this to chart school. Again, if you want to get more information on the specifics of the pitchfork or the RAF regression, um, chart school is the place to go. If there's interest, we can do a little bit more of a deep dive, but some of those topics are can, can uh, take a lot of time. So I'm just going to gloss over this just to show the basics, of the annotations. Um, some of the tools, since they are working with the underlying data, you really want to be fairly precise. I don't know if you've noticed, but at the bottom of the price panel over here in the left, as I move the cursor, it's a sort of a mini inspector. I've got the open, high, low, close, and volume 
as well as the value of the Y chart. In this case, that's the price. As I move the cursor, I can get that value. So if I want to move this, some of these handle points to very specific points, I can use the this display down at the bottom and know that I'm going absolutely for August 21st. So there I've got it. And this will be true of any of the panels we can see down here uh, on the MACD. We've got the value and the date. It sort of changes based on whether it's a price panel or just an indicator panel. And then finally, our last one are speed lines. Again, we talked about this. If we want to save the chart, we can upload it. We can select which list we want to put it in. We can change the name. We can then upload it. I'm not going to save that now. Um, here's our help. It goes over all the basic tools, which we talked about saving and unsaving. We've got some of our global hotkeys. One of the things we didn't really go through is if you want to circulate through your annotations, you can use the tab and shift tab, just much like you would use in Windows uh, control tab to go um, iterate through your applications. You can iterate through your your annotations this way. And then here's all of these uh, command and clicks and drags and shifts and all those. The help, it will determine whether you're on a Mac or a PC and automatically change that command to either command or control, depending upon which uh, machine you're on. I'm on a Mac right now, so all of mine are command, but if you're on Windows, those would all say control. So that's just a, a uh, reiteration of all of the uh, tips and tricks there for all of the keyboard items and then finally to get out we've got our little x over here we'll just click this i'm not going to save and then we're back out to our regular chart and that's sort of a very quick overview uh any of the specifics there i would uh, suggest people go to a uh, chart school as pretty much everything if you want more information chart school's got a wealth of information on all of those tools like say if there's interest we can uh take some time to maybe deep dive into a specific one as to how to use the, the specific tool in conjunction with uh, the data on the chart. And that's, uh, that's pretty much the overview. It's a little bit fast and furious. There's a lot there, but I uh, figured we would just do this as a high level intro and then we can uh, maybe dive into some more specifics on another show. Yeah, I was looking, Bill, at the, uh, as you were going through all the tools, trying to find out whether or not GE's a buy. Uh, <laughs> I haven't written the uh, the buy tool yet. <laughs> <laughs> we did a, a couple of questions um, I, that we pretty much answered in the chat box, mm -hmm. but uh, one that I don't know: Can you delete a call out handle? So you know how I know I've done this where I've created like three and I only meant to have like two. Um, I just hide them. But is there a way to just uh, delete yeah, one of those? Yeah, I don't don't think there's a way to delete the the call out. Uh, handles. Um, usually I would just recreate them. I, my personal style is I don't end up with tons of handles. Um, so I usually, I'd like to say, I just usually point out prices. So I, I'll just usually recreate one. Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I, or if I'm in a hurry, like I said, I'll just hide it under the call out. <laughs> right. Just, yeah. Put the point behind the call out. I've done the same thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just get a little too excited on the, on drawing uh, those. And then I realize, oh, this chart looks a little bit confusing. That's, um, it. You can overdo the annotations. Um, some people, I've seen some charts that are so covered with annotations. It's amazing um, to be able to make heads or tails of it. So a lot of times I suggest if you start to get charts that are, have tons and tons of annotations, um, you can create multiple charts. We have people will have charts that will be have annotations that will stretch for years. And of course, there is a limit to the number of annotations. And at some point, we'll have to just start removing old annotations. Um, in those cases, if you want to keep long, long history, what I would suggest doing is to create a separate chart and you can cr then create a, a, a date range. And then you'll be able to always go back to that chart. So one of the things I was talking about with my charts, I'll put in buys and sells. So I'll track a trade and maybe at the end I'll put a call out box that says, okay, I bought for this. I bought, sold for that. Here's my percentage gain or loss. Any notes. I use it as almost like a, a trader's journal. And then when I'm done with it, I can create um, a date range to save it. And then I'll put it in a, a chart list that's say 2018 closed trades and I can go back and review them. 
It makes sense. Yeah, really interesting. Any other questions, Erin? Um, let's see. I mean, some of them were already answered, but as far as uh, Fibonacci levels and uh, again, our, our trusty customer service folks in the back of answered it already in the chat box, but since people can't always see that, the question was, let's see if I can find the actual question. It was about Fibonacci and changing the, um, percentages yes yeah, so there's always requests for uh, more and more fibonacci lines um so what we've got so far we're probably going to keep for a while i know we added the um that extra 160 and the 22 i think obviously there's a number of additional ones that could be added um, at this point we don't really have any plans to to add a whole lot more of the uh, retracement fibonacci values sure let's see yeah they wanted to change them from right yeah. Uh, yeah, we really just have the ability to toggle those extras on. There's no real way to to say I want to make a change from the 67 to 62 or what it change, you know, an arbitrary line number or percentage right. number. Right. Those were really. I think you must have done a great job because we really didn't get too many questions. I did. We did uh, get a asked a question uh, asking for the link to the chart school. Um, article on chart notes. So I will put that in the Market Watchers live blog for you to go to and you can look up more of these. But I have to say I learned quite a bit. <laughs> and we do have a link here on this little help help dialogue down here. Click here for more help. Oh, there you go. And so there's our chart notes overview. And I would suggest going through it. It is a very there's a lot here and we've just kind of blasted over it. Um, and I hope that people maybe have seen some some little tips and tricks or uh, tools they didn't really realize were there or didn't know how they work. But if you want to spend a little bit more time and go in and kind of research it, definitely uh, scroll through the uh, the help topic up here. There's tons of things to recap because uh, we did kind of have to um, skip over a lot of this stuff fairly quickly to try and cover as much as possible. Indeed. All Excellent. right. Great. Excellent. Thanks uh, for joining us today, Bill. Uh, yeah. Very informative as always. Uh, thanks again. And uh, I guess we will see one of your uh, cohorts there at Stock Charts next Tuesday. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So that was the tips and tricks for this week. I know we've got momentum sleepers. So Aaron, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. All right, let's do this. So what we're looking for and you know, I talked to Tom because I wanted his opinion on what he would consider uh, a momentum sleeper. And, you know, we were looking at with everything coming around, kind of cupping up or in the middle of trading, uh, trading zones, that what we wanted to do was find something with a momentum that's starting to move out that maybe people aren't seeing right now. So I went ahead and, as usual, went, found one of my trusty PMO scans. So I put that here for you, uh, very similar to the one that I have linked in the Market Watchers live blog. Um, I think the only difference is I'm looking for one that has actually had a PMO crossover. So I want it to have been rising for three days, but then I want it to have already had that crossover. So that's really the main difference in this particular scan from the one that uh, I have, I think in our, uh, the link is at the bottom of every Market Watchers live recap. Uh, so it'll take you to my PMO scan, but it won't be exactly this. But you, you know, really, once you have that main one, you can go ahead and just start manipulating it as much as you want. Um, I think the hard part is just getting the, the PMO rising information in there. The rest are pretty, pretty uh, simple. But I ran this scan earlier today, and the, this was what I got as possible momentum sleepers. I went through all of them and picked out what I thought were uh, actually you know, good choices. So I have that list over here. Uh, so the ones I went through are these five. And so I'll just go through them really quickly and, and what I'm seeing and why I think they're uh, momentum sleepers or have some interesting information going on there. So right now, this is the, the first one. And granted, this is we're talking pretty low volume at times on this one. So you might see a little bit of volatility. You can see that um, you know, we've been in we've been in somewhat of a trading zone. If you want to go that direction, the main thing I wanted to point out was I have positive a positive uh, divergence on a Viva. 
you can see that we had mostly horizontal bottom price bottoms here, but we had rising, <clears throat> excuse me, rising PMO bottoms. We've got the buy signal. So I like that breakout. Not only did we get the breakout yesterday above this declining tops trend line, but now we've broken uh, through that overhead resistance area too. You can see we're trading below that. But I think, again, this with the momentum picking up here, uh, the positive divergence, I would look for a move uh, at least up here. My target would be about 1470, I think, for this one. So I thought that looked pretty good. Columbia Sportswear was another one that came up. And I was seeing an ascending triangle here, which is a bullish pattern. You can see we tried to break out uh, last week didn't really have success. Uh, trying again this week. This time I like the setup better because now we're seeing that buy signal. We're seeing, um, you know, we're, we're seeing that breakout. And I think you could also, if you look in the thumbnail, make a case for a uh, flag, a bull flag. So that would, you know, that tells you to look for an upside breakout and the move could be as long as the flagpole is. So that would be a pretty sizable move. So we're getting that shift in momentum and pro possibly a breakout from this ascending triangle. The next one I had was Docomo, NTT Docomo. Uh, it's always interesting what comes up in my scans. I, I mean, so many times it's it's uh, their stocks that I've never really dealt with or have heard of, but have come up on the radar. And that's kind of why I like the scans, because, you know, usually back before I was uh, using stock charts and had this ability to use a scan engine uh, quite a few years ago, you know, I could only look at my spreadsheets. I could only look at, you know, the S&P 500 or the OEX, you know, certain things like that. I was really constricted. And now we're not constricted using the scan engine. So that's why I always find it interesting when I get a new stock coming up. But again, very low volume. So just be aware of that. Uh, but nice flag formation, a nice breakout from overhead resistance. And look at the PMO, nice buy signal. And then we also see a, a bullish confirmation with rising bottoms on the PMO and rising bottoms on price. So you know, add that to a, a nice looking scooter. And you know, I think this one has some possibilities as a momentum sleeper. This one actually did not come up in my scan, but when I put in uh, SKX, cause that's the next one I'm going to look at, uh, it, it auto corrected to SIX. And so I, I it pulled it up cause I thought it was what I was wanting and then it wasn't. But then I saw the chart and I thought, wow, this still looks like a pretty good chart here. So let me point it out. So I ended up looking at this. I've got a double bottom coming off this decline. We haven't actually gotten the breakout just yet, but you can see the five is rising to get above that 20. And I think that's positive. And again, oversold PMO buy signal. And that seems to be coming in nicely and we're getting price rise, uh, off of that bottom that we see on that PMO. Uh, you know, OBV, and I, I noticed on some of these, the OBV didn't look particularly exciting necessarily, uh, but this is, you know, flat. I'm not gonna get too concerned. The rising scooter, I think, is also a, a nice uh, setup here as well on this momentum sleeper. And Skechers was the last one I had. And uh, this one's been in a trading, uh, trading zone here, uh, trading channel. And I've got that PMO buy signal now that's come in above the zero line. Granted, I'm not thrilled with um, the fact that our PMO bottoms are falling, yet um, we're seeing the price bottoms mostly sideways or trying to move higher. I, I'm not overly concerned about that just because we've been in this trading zone and we're finally getting that buy signal. We didn't really get it back here. And now we're getting a clean crossover uh, flag formation, possibly looking in here that would give us a move about the size of this uh, tra uh, trading channel, which is about what, four, uh, $4 in this case. So a move to $46 is a possibility here. So I thought this one was a, a good possibility for a momentum sleeper. I know we're low on time, but uh, Tom, did you have any that you wanted to pass along? No, I would just go, uh, first of all, I mentioned Skechers, I think, yesterday. There you go. So, um, you know, this is a stock I thought looked pretty good. It's basing off of an uptrend, so I, I agree with you. 
Um, I think this one, especially with that your PMO, I know the PPO that I looked at also had moved back towards center line support and it's just starting to turn back up. So, yeah, I think this is a good one. I mean, now that we're near resistance, I'd like to see that breakout, but uh, heavy volume would certainly convert, confirm that move to the upside. So, uh, you know, as a quick summary on um, the momentum sleepers that uh, we just went over, um, got a number of them there. And I think that uh, as the market continues to consolidate, um, you know, we'll probably have some opportunities to uh, take a look at some other momentum sleepers in the future as well. All righty. So with uh, uh, 10 yeah. and 10. Yeah. Let's here we go. That. Let me, I actually have just a few more to add here that came in late. So I'm going to throw those in here that I can see right now. Anet was another. If yours doesn't get selected or I missed it, um, forgive me, but you can watch tomorrow and maybe we'll be able to select the one you want. But when we're looking at 34 and we only get to do 10, uh, you know, somebody, a lot of people aren't going to be too happy. Go ahead and like any of those symbol requests. Uh, I'm going to be closing that out because after the first one, I give Tom, uh, the next one will be the most popular. And let's go look just quickly at an RRG. Someone asked me about uh, weekly versus daily. You know, I, I was switching it to daily for the very short term look, but you know, after talking to Julius, he really prefers the weekly setup. So I went ahead and I'm just keeping it there because what we want to, what I'm more interested in when I look at the 10 and 10 are sectors and then where they are as far as leading, uh, improving weakening and lagging. So I like to look at that with the 10 and 10 and, and see if that gives me anything interesting to give you. So with that, Merck, M-R-K is our first one. Okay, um, I do wanna just, uh, let's, just trying to save it real quick. I, I went ahead and annotated it. And uh, I tell you, coming off the heels of what uh, Bill Shelby just went over, I thought uh, you know I would take advantage of all of his great information and uh, I put everything on this chart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is a joke, everybody. <laughs> this is not the way I annotate, but I thought it was pretty funny just to kind of, you know, Bill mentioned, you know, when you use the annotation tool and you get carried away, you can be looking at something that just makes no sense whatsoever. So that was the whole idea here. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to show you how bad sometimes you can be with the annotation tool. So let's clean it up and uh, we'll take a look, a different look at, at Merck. Let's take a look at this one. Okay, so Merck, um, in my opinion, we had the huge move up with heavy volume back in January. I think that was an earnings related move, but we did put that long tail in, tried to break out above the October high, couldn't do it, and we went all the way back down and tested the support level here at about 53. And that has held up throughout the last several months. So 53 was major support. And over the past 10 weeks or so, we've really struggled to get back up above about 56. But we did do that yesterday. We closed above with heavy volume as the heaviest volume we had seen throughout this consolidation period. And we did close above these prior highs. And today we are moving up again. Uh, notice also that for Merck, we've got the PPO crossing back up into positive territory. So we're getting that bullish PPO crossover, which I think is awesome. I don't really see, and, and what I had highlighted over here on the left side is volume by price. And so you can see over the past few months, the volume, the major volume has been down in this zone. So now that we're breaking out, there's not a lot of volume that has traded between say 56 and 60. I think Mark has a really good chance here to make a move towards 60, so I like it. All righty. I have a tie between three uh, choices, so I'm gonna give everybody one more chance to like their favorite uh, symbol requests and help break that tie. But in the meantime, uh, let's go ahead and look at um, an industrial, CHRW, CH Robinson. Yeah, another one that's been consolidating for quite a while. I mean, this could be another one of those momentum type sleepers. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, uh, movement to the upside, trying to get back to, okay, that's not a really good, uh, that's not my normal. Let's just go ahead and use red for that. So you can see that we've got gap resistance on the huge gap down at the end of January. See how we closed before that huge volume. Since then, we have not been able to close back above 94. We did have this one day where we opened temporarily above it and then sold off from there. But to the downside, we've got some pretty good support at 
the, oh, let's just call it right around $88. So very similar to uh, what we were just looking at with Merck, where we traded in a, certain, in a range for a while, except in this case, we haven't broken out yet. So what we want to see is that volume pick up, and we want to get this breakout above 94. If that occurs, I think we'll probably go back up to retest these late January highs. All right. I still have a tiebreaker on the top two, so I think I'll just, uh, well, I'll include possibly both. I know we're going over energy, so ConocoPhillips was one, so I think I'm going to uh, not do that one. Sorry, guys. Uh, there is a tie with uh, Alphabet. Uh, Google. So I think we'll go with Google. And trust me, you're going to get a lot of energy stocks in the next segment. Um, ConocoPhillips we did yesterday, too. So yeah. anybody who's interested could go back and look at yesterday's. Um, we've been trading in this range on Google. It's fairly wide range, except it is an internet stock. So there's, a, you know, expected, uh, should be expected a, a number or a lot of volatility. Um, but for now, I think this is more of a intermediate term trading range on Google, and we are down near the, the lower end. I can tell you that the internet stocks have been very weak on a relative basis for the last four or five weeks. And as a result, we're seeing a number of stocks. I think Facebook has really been the one that's taken the group down. But a lot of them, even the ones that look much more bullish, have been have kind of gone down in sympathy. So I would watch Google at this area right around 1,000. I think as long as it holds, I'm okay with it. All right. Let's see the next one. Let's do IGT. And where is that one? I'm... International game. Okay, this is in the gambling yeah. space. By the way, gambling stocks tend to do very well in April. And uh, so far, not so good for international game. But uh, it is at a key support area. After the gap up that we saw back here in November on very heavy volume, the reaction lows have been down close to about 25 and a half. Yesterday, we went down just a little bit below it. The volume did pick up a little, although if you look back over the last month or two, it's been kind of average volume for it. Uh, I would be looking for the stock to trade between yesterday's low and that declining 20-day moving average. So I would maybe put just a little arrow in here at the 20. And that's kind of the area I expect that we're going to see international game technology squeeze in. But I would not be surprised. And what I would love to see is something similar to what we saw back in February, where we go below this level, leave a long tail, and then come back up, because I think that could lead to a more pronounced advance over the next few weeks. Uh, and again, with gambling stocks historically performing well in April, I would feel even better about some kind of reversing candle. All righty. From uh, Home Construction, LGI Homes. L-G-I-H. Yeah, I actually, I'm seeing some real positives out of home construction of late. This is a group that led throughout 2017 on a relative basis, really struggled the first few months of the year, but has started to kind of right the ship again. And so I think this is a group that's uh, beginning to outperform. And so I would, uh, essentially, I would favor it going forward. Um, I would want to continue to watch that rising 20-day moving average. So I am going to just highlight recently a couple of tests here on the 20. We did go just below the 20 and print that hammer and come right back up above. So I think the 20-day moving average with the PPO continuing to move higher is going to provide good support. I look for this stock and many of the stocks in this space to go back and challenge the uh, uh, January high. All righty. Uh, from the Biotechs Immunogen, IMGN. Yeah, many of the biotechs, as I mentioned yesterday, have really struggled. Uh, I would expect right around 970 to hold on this stock. And what I would hope that would be forming would be maybe a cup. So just a quick look at this. You can see right there, we had to move up on heavy volume. We reversed back down. We broke out on heavy volume. And we have not since closed back below 970. And here we are. What we could be looking at, and if we look at this uh, parabola as a possible cup, I could see something like that being the high, this being the low, and then maybe we're going to start to turn back up right here. Uh, clearing $11 would go a long way to helping IMGN and to the downside again, I would watch uh, that 970 area. All right. From the materials, steel industry, Worthington, WOR. All right. WOR. 
Um, breaking back up above the 20 day moving average. So that's good. Like to see a little bit of volume. And I want to see this confirm on the close today. Um, we see this sometimes in downtrends where we break up above the 20 and we fail and then we come back down. Uh, so I would be a little nervous if we leave a tail above the 20 and come back down. Uh, we do see the PPO starting to rise though. So perhaps another low, what we might look for is a positive divergence to develop. So the PPO is starting to strengthen. So if we do fail, and I'm not saying we're going to, we may just break right up uh, through that 20 day and start to move higher. But if we do break to one more low to the downside, um, what we could look for is maybe something like this, where the PPO is rising. We go down, we put in a new low. We've also got great price support down here at uh, around 39 or just above 39. So if we went a little bit lower than that last low, we could be hitting a major support with a positive divergence. That's something to look for if we turn back down. Now, if we're turning up, I think the first key area of resistance is going to be $43. That was support here. We broke below it, came back up, tested it from underneath, went back down again. So we've got to get through 43 to the upside, 39 is your support to the downside. All righty. From the utilities sector, CenturyLink, CTL. All right, uh, CTL, uh, just kind of consolidating here. Break above about 1860, I would like. I think that would be very bullish for CTL. And that would just be breaking above the mid-February high off of the gap. You can see the heavy volume gap up. Came down, held gap support with a reversing candle, bullish engulfing. Tried to get back up, almost got to 1850. And then we saw a little bit more selling. I think major support now is down to 1550. Resistance is at 1850. Probably wouldn't do anything with stock at this point if I didn't already own it. I'd either wait for the breakout or I'd wait for support down closer to 1550. All righty. Let's see. From uh, the apparel retailers, and I suspect Kohl's will do very well because I'm going to go shop there later today. So. There you go. ASS. You got the whole Kohl's thing. I got Starbucks covered. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I like the I like the stock. In fact, I'm going to bring it up on the relative chart because I think it's the group itself that continues to do pretty well. Here are the retail apparel or the apparel retailers, I should say. Big move heading into 2018. And I think just sideways consolidating right now, maybe even in like a little bit of a triangle, um, which is what Kohl's is doing as well. Just consolidating sideways. Um, so I, I think this, this, this particular stock looks really interesting. I think at one point I was looking at perhaps an ascending triangle. I don't know, maybe it's carrying, a, you know, it's going out a little bit too far for that. Um, if you wanted to continue to look at it as maybe an ascending triangle, you know, maybe something like this. Oh, I think it is. I think that's a good call. Yeah, but it, uh, you know, it's usually A, B, C, D, and then E uh, is your breakout on an ascending triangle. So we've got the A, B, C pretty clear. This could be the D and it's just really been slow to make this breakout, but the market overall is not helping as well. I think it's in a bullish pattern though. You got a nice uptrend sideways consolidation. I'd be looking for a breakout. All righty. And final will be um, FSLR for solar. Yeah, renewable energy has been doing very well. And uh, just to go ahead and throw this one up here as well. Uh, there was a, well, actually they've got it in semiconductors. I look at the stock as a renewable um, energy stock. But uh, from a price perspective, let me annotate. Um, right here at about 77 is your key resistance that we need to break out from. Uh, again, I see another rising trend line here uh, from the recent lows, which I think is pretty bullish. So you got a nice uptrend in play, sideways consolidating, but we're printing higher lows, need to break out above 77. I think eventually it will happen. Um, you know, maybe it's being held back a little bit by the semis, but again, I think the renewable energy stocks are a little bit better group to watch for first solar and a breakout above 77 would be very bullish. All right. And that concludes the 10 and 10. And here are the symbols that Tom annotated. I will have those up in the Market Watchers Live chart list where you can find it. Just go to the Market Watchers Live blog page and the link to that Market Watchers Live chart list is right there at the top. And these symbols will be in there. And I usually have the last two days worth of 10 and 10 as well in there. So go check that out. And now 
It is time to talk about something very exciting coming up in August. And here we go. And I think we put the uh, link up there, but stockcharts.com slash chartcon, and you'll get to this page and you'll see this conference that we have coming up in August. And it, the great thing is, number one, we're talking about risk. And I know everybody, uh, you know, we get that those questions all the time in the question box. So I think this will help quite a bit on figuring out stops, on figuring out, uh, you know, your risk reward on buys. And the great thing is, guys, you don't have to be there. It is an online event. And right now we do have early bird pricing at 199. If you want samples of what uh, the online chart con is like, we are playing 2016, uh, some of those videos from that previous chart con. Do not count on the 2018 chart con making it to Stock Charts TV anytime soon, um, if ever. So that's why you really wanna go ahead and do this. Uh, at this point, there are no plans to show it on Stock Charts TV. So if you want to uh, attend live, you can do that, or you will get the, the live stream. You'll have that all those videos to watch whenever you want to, wherever you are. And so you can have that in uh, that in your toolbox to go back to. And you know, when you look at the agenda and those that are presenting, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't want all of these in your, uh, you know, on your hard drive somewhere to go back to and, and look at over and over. So highly recommend you check out ShartCon. Uh, we are, I think, I think we can still, yep, I think you can still get a seat and come live if you would like. I think we do. Nope, I don't think you can do that anymore. Uh, so if you wanted to come in person, I don't think we have any of that uh, available, but you can certainly talk to our, our ChartCon customer service and, and see what is available. So anyway, that's uh, what we have for ChartCon. I, I won't uh, go on and on about it too much more. Did you wanna add anything, Tom? Cause I know we are pretty excited about it too. Yeah, I mean, I'm really looking forward to just getting together and, and talk and shop with everybody. Um, you know, our, our uh, I think all the talks in the past at the 2016 ChartCon uh, were very educational. Um, I know I sat in on a number of them. I think you did as well, Aaron. Yes. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, kind of, I feel like for me, I, I get in my own world sometimes from a technical analysis perspective. And occasionally I'll be able to go over and read some of the blogs at Stock Charts. But this is an opportunity to really sit down for a period of time and get what everyone else's thoughts are about the market. So I think it's a great one-stop shop, uh, really. I mean, I've been to, I mentioned this before, but I've been to a lot of these um, conferences, you know, the International Traders Expo, the money shows. Um, when I was with uh, Invested Central and then Earnings Beats, I mean, we used to market at those events and they really were more selling kind of conferences, more than educational. You could pick up a few tidbits educationally, but really it was about trying to sell software, trying to sell service. That's not what ChartCon is all about. This is very, very much uh, about education and uh, teaching you or maybe refining some of your skills or maybe adding a few skills to your arsenal in how to approach the stock market. So, And I think the topic, just the fact that we're trying to manage risk, I think is huge uh, because as I've said before, as a trader, I think that managing risk is the most important part of trading. You might think, well, I want to make money but you've got to be able to manage your risk in trying to make that money. You can't just go in and, you know, throw both feet in the water and just dive in um, and, you know, forego the risk, not really look at the risk. I think the risk part of it is the most important part of trading and investing. And so I think you're going to have a lot of great uh, sessions that you can learn from. Absolutely. And like I said, just having those on your hard drive somewhere to go back to uh, is that, that makes it really worth it anyway. I mean, if you go to a conference, you're not gonna get to have that uh, recording of everybody's uh, topics, so. And yes, I know we sat next to each other quite a bit during the last one, uh, sitting front and center for, for some of those uh, presentations because there is a lot to learn. So yeah. with that, I'm gonna go ahead and go into our final market update, give you a quick peek at what's been going on in the market. And we will just go right here. 
And I'm going to take you to our candle glance and I'll show you also how you can manipulate it to see what you want because I like to include the TSX for everybody. Um, let's go ahead and we'll add the XLE in here since we've been talking about energy and we are going to talk about it in the next segment. And here we go. So obviously a great opening to the market. Looks like we may have hit the intraday highs for the day uh, and we're coming back down, but does, we are starting to get a little bit of a move back up after hitting recent lows around lunchtime. As you can see, NASDAQ also up. Uh, Russell 2000 small caps, I did write about them looking rather weak. So of course they are having a very strong day because that's how it works when you blog. Uh, but anyway, nice day for the small caps. They, they really needed that. And you can uh, read my blog article from yesterday and you'll agree. Uh, TSX opened up, but has been pulling back the entire time, probably lost about half the gains already today. Um, we'll see if the US markets uh, end up going in that same direction a little bit slower. Treasury yields are higher right now, reading at 2801. We can see that UUP had a big gap down, but has uh, started to make a move back up. Now it's forming a little bit of a, a flag here. So we'll have to see if we can get that breakout. I can tell you, I have been waiting forever for the dollar to break out and it's just not happening. It doesn't look like it's gonna happen today. Commodities gap up, moving up uh, continuously past that, uh, setting uh, intraday highs as we speak. USO, similar gap up. Uh, continuing to rise higher, but flattening out just a little bit right now near the intraday highs. You can see gold is up, reading 127 for GLD. The VIX is lower on the day, but reading about 2114, still somewhat elevated. <clears throat> and finally, the XLE, very similar chart, of co course, to USO. The XLE is made up of quite a few uh, oil uh, companies, obviously. So we get the, the gap up and we're, we are starting to see the top round out just a little bit here. So we may have uh, gotten all we're going to get out of uh, XLE today, but there's still a lot of trading time left. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Tom, if you had anything you wanted to add uh, at this point. I didn't do the market summary, but yeah, I, I was, um, on. yeah, I was just looking at, um, the CRB, which is commodities, and, and comparing it to the S&P 500, because I've talked a lot, you know, the dollar, um, because it has been, for the most part, now last year hasn't been so strong, but since 2011, we bought them, the dollar's been rising. And so commodities relative to the S&P 500 it's, have suffered a little bit because they do have that dollar headwind. But here you can see at the end of March, uh, commodities did make a big move relative to the S&P 500. We pulled back a little bit, but we're bouncing off of that rising 20-day moving average. And we haven't seen that kind of bullish action in quite a while um, on a relative basis from commodities. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in that same camp with you. I'm expecting the dollar to break out. And if it does, I think it's going to present some headwinds for the, for the CRB. But at least right now, without it breaking out, uh, I think uh, commodities are starting to gain a little bit of strength, relative strength versus the S&P 500. So I think this is going to be worth uh, considering and watching here over the next few weeks just to see whether or not this relative strength can continue and take out that recent high. Excellent. And with that, why don't we go ahead and get ourselves into the what would you do section uh, segment of the program. Uh, right now we're running a poll in the um, Slido app on the right to the viewer window. And even if you are watching this in a recording, if you set up a little profile for Slido, you can make a vote uh, as well. And this will be up, I think the live poll will be up until tomorrow morning sometime when uh, at that point we do the new show. But the question is today, which of these three XLE components would you buy? And those would be uh, Chevron, S, uh, CVX, which is, uh, yeah, CVX. We have ExxonMobil, XOM, and Schlumberger, SLB. So the question is, which of those three would you buy? Um, Tom, I'm going to let you start with this one, if that's all right. Yeah, that's fine. Um, let me first, I want to pull up and just show everyone the ranking. And the reason why we picked XOM, CVX, and SLB, I've gone over to Yahoo, and I've typed in the XLE, 
And so I've pulled it up and you can see here for the XLE, there's this holdings thing, tab that you can click on. And so down at the bottom here, you can see what the XLE holds, the top 10 holdings, which represents 72% of the XLE. But just take a look at the first three. We've got ExxonMobil at 22.6%, Chevron 16.7%, Schlumberger 7.21%. So right here, we're looking at almost one half of the XLE is dependent on these three stocks with a lot of weighting toward the ExxonMobil and Chevron stocks. So the question is, now that we're seeing the breakout, the reason that we're breaking out is because the three top stocks are having really nice days and starting to perform much better. So here you've got XOM. And XOM, after bottoming, is now breaking out above that 50-day moving average. You've got CVX, which also has bottomed and sideways consolidated and is breaking out above the recent uh, highs. And then you've got Schlumberger, SLB, which is trying to get through its 50-day moving average. Now, as I went through and looked at these three stocks, I saw a lot of similarities um, obviously, we, we really struggled after the January highs. We pulled back. We consolidated. But I think the subtle strength to me is being shown, there's subtle relative strength between these three. It's being shown in Chevron. Uh, Chevron not only has cleared both its 20 and 50-day moving average, we have now seen a cross. We've seen the 20 cross back up above the 50, which if we take a look at the other two, uh, XOM, you can see that we still got a long way to go there. We don't even know for sure if we're going to get a close above the 50-day um, on that one just yet. And Schlumberger, the same thing. I mean, we're right up against the 50. So clearly, we haven't had the 20 cross back up through. But if I go back to CVX, I think what we're seeing is not only are we getting this golden cross, but look at the three attempts here to get above 118 and to get above this gap resistance. And we were unable to do it on those uh prior three or four tries, but now today we're doing it. So there's kind of the line going across right here. Notice the volume on this gap down, the continuing move here, a lot of volume, big reversal. The next day we tried to get through 118, couldn't do it. And look at all these attempts to get through 118. Today, it looks like we're finally doing it. So I think Chevron on a relative basis looks a little better than the other two. PPO now has made that bullish cross, looks to be uh, moving higher. I think if the XLE runs, Chevron's going to be the better performer. So I'm going to go with CVX. All righty. Uh, let's see. I'm going to go through my three very quickly. Gosh, why do I keep getting it ends up there all the time and I don't want it there. Here we go. All right. So here are my what would you do. So I'm going to start with a Chevron, which you just went through. Uh, a couple things I really like. I see an ascending triangle, which of course is a bullish pattern. Gotta like that. I like the fact that the 50-day EMA is above the 200-day EMA. That gives me a bullish configuration, a, a bull market setup for Chevron. So that's what you would like to see there. Look at the um, positive territory. The PMO is just about ready to get there. We had a nice clean PMO buy signal in oversold territory. Scooter is starting to show some improvement uh, over peers. So I, I do like the setup here for Chevron. And let's go with uh, Schlumberger, the next one. Problem, 50-day EMA is below the 200. And, and add to that, the 20 is below the 50. We did just get a 520-day EMA positive crossover. It looks like we're going to get that today, which is a short-term trend model buy signal. We did get a breakout from that declining tops trend line. And this I thought was very interesting, uh, the positive divergence uh, that I'm seeing here with the rising bottoms on the PMO, yet uh, the bottoms on price moving downwards. So that's positive, you wanna see that. So I think that Schlumberger looks pretty good. I think there are a few problems with it, but I don't think you'd be necessarily disappointed if you got into it. Exxon Mobil, and again, look, okay, the, I thought that this one had the worst looking EMAs. I mean, you've got huge distance between the 50 and 200, even between the 20 and 50. I mean, we're, we're going to wait a long time before we get that uh, intermediate term trend model buy signal where the 20 would cross above the 50. So that immediately um, bothered me. 
we already got the breakout from this uh, descending wedge, falling wedge. And, you know, that's happened. Uh, I think, you know, you're looking here at some uh, resistance right around 77. Uh, you know, we're reading at 77.29 right now. So we're getting the breakout above that overhead resistance that I noted from back here in 2017. And there is a good play, you know, the target's pretty high. Uh, PMO is, you know, moving higher as the price bottoms are moving lower. I didn't annotate that. And we are getting an improving scooter. So what's the difference really between ExxonMobil and uh, the other one that I'm interested in here, Chevron? The big difference is the EMA configuration. The 50 is above the 200. The 20 is nearing that positive crossover. It should have that when you've got price that far above uh, the 50-day EMA. Uh, and I, I like the breakout better. And you know, so when I compare that to ExxonMobil, which I still think looks pretty good, like I said, uh, you know, the EMAs really just give me heartburn right now. And we got the breakout already from that chart pattern. So I would lean toward Chevron as my pick. So both of us agree with uh, Chevron as of the three, which one would you buy? And I guess that's a good thing, right? Isn't that, was that the top holding? Um, no, ExxonMobil was the top the holding. Top holding. Yep. But it was a second, so it yep. still holds a lot. Yep. So what does everybody else think? Uh, let's see. CVX. Uh, everybody went with uh, Chevron. Very I think good. it was somewhat of an easy pick when you, you think when you looked at the chart patterns. But like I said, I think you could make a case for ExxonMobil as well. Yeah, I, well, I could make an argument really for all three. I mean, I thought all three of them looked pretty good. I think the bottoms, we did see some positive divergences. CVX is just maybe a little bit more advanced in its technicals as far as I'm concerned. So it's looking more bullish. I'd feel more comfortable owning it um, and being able to set my stops on CVX. See, the problem with XOM or SLB, if I bought them today and they didn't break above the 50-day moving average, I'd be a little concerned. Mm -hmm. CVX has already made that move. We've got the Golden Cross. And now I, I'm actually more confident that when it pulls back and tests the rising 20-day moving average, it's going to hold. So for me, it's more about confidence. I think all three look good. And to be honest, the XLE uh, in general looks very good. I don't know if you uh, realize this, Aaron, but um, when you look at the scooters of all of the uh, ETFs right now, the mm -hmm. nine ETFs, consumer discretionary is first, technology second, energy is right on their heels, third. Hmm. On uh, scooters. Yep, the scooters. Cyclicals right now is 85.8. Technology is 83.5 and I energy. Think you steal the screen and show us. All right. Let me go ahead and just <laughs> steal it real quick. Yeah, we have some time. Um, but here you go. You got uh, consumer discretionary or cyclicals 85.8, technology 83.5, and energy, which has been lagging and hasn't been able to break out of the 66 to 69 range on the XLE, all of a sudden makes a breakout, obviously having a very strong day today, but the scooters have quickly moved up and another good day or two and energy is actually going to have the highest scooter rank among all of our ETFs, which is, I think, pretty surprising. I'm, I was surprised when I looked at that. I was expecting energy might be 50, but it has quickly moved up the ladder and uh, not too uh, far away from being the best scooter uh, mm -hmm. ETF. Yeah. And the, on this, oh gosh, the, the circle that I follow, the sector rotation circle, I mean, that, that could be, a good thing, but I think it's listed as possibly, you know, when you're coming toward the end of your bull market, you're going to see energy start to do a little bit better. It's not defensive, you know, it's not a staple and not in staples or healthcare, but um, I, I mean, I think that's interesting when you, you think about that, but, you know, and, and a lot of the stuff I've been writing about, you know, as far as the sector rotation, we are looking in the very short term. It makes a lot of sense that you would have defensive sectors doing well while the market is not doing so well because that's you know the safety zone like like gold. Um, the problem is is that it it's been continuing on kind of long and it's uh, long in the tooth I guess the fact that we're still seeing some of those defensive sectors at least in terms of price performance still doing pretty well and XLE moving up. Uh, you know, that could be a little bit of a cause for concern. But again, you know, I think uh, when I was talking to Greg before the show, one of the shows last week, 
you know, he, I was talking to him about that and he was like, yeah, but you know, really when, uh, you know, you should worry about the bear market really coming on strong is after you've had, you know, a couple, like three months, you know, where you've seen those particular defensive sectors doing well. Um, from what I'm looking at in the last month and a half, those three sectors are performing better than the others. So that does concern me, but I think there are a lot of things here that are, are lining up a little bit better. Tech has been really suffering, and I think that's been the big problem. Yeah, I think too. I mean, for me, I don't really look at XLE as being defensive. I, I look at the XLE and the XLB kind of like standalone. I have four mm -hmm. aggressive groups, the XLK, the XLY, XLI, and the XLF. Um, which are your technology, consumer discretionary, industrials, and financials. Mm -hmm. And then defensive, utilities are clearly defensive. Yeah. Consumer staples are, are clearly defensive. And then most areas of healthcare, I would say, are defensive, although mm -hmm. biotechs, I think, are pretty aggressive part. But I always look at XLE and XLB. I, normally, when I'm trying to evaluate the sustainability of a move in the S&P 500, I tend to, to ignore what's going on with energy mm -hmm. and materials because there are so many outside influences, especially with energy. I mean, you could have geopolitical concerns, uh, you know, anything going on inside one of these countries that's a major oil producer can all of a sudden throw this group one direction or the other. I don't know that they necessarily tell us what's going on here in the U.S. and whether the S&P 500 is, you know, a, a rally right. sustainable. And the other point I would make is just the last couple of months when we have seen a little bit of leadership out of rel out of uh, the defensive areas, it's been during a downturn, Exactly, in, which is normal. What I'd be more concerned about is when the S&P rises and these defensive groups start leading. That to me is a big, big warning sign. Mm -hmm. and we really haven't seen that. So I'm still bullish, but you know, who yeah. knows? I mean, I'm with you too, the uh, XLE, that it is sort of in between. And depending on who you talk to, it doing well is either a bad sign or a good sign. So, because it does, it, it's sort of right there in the middle. So I agree with you that way too. Yep. So. And tomorrow we got your father coming on the show. Yes, I'm very excited about that. Um, I, I need to talk to him. I'm kind of curious what he's going to be talking about. Um, he hasn't shown me his charts yet, and usually we have a, a discussion. So uh, we'll have to, to see what he has in store for us. But I know it'll probably be more intermediate term related for those uh, viewers out there. You'll enjoy that. And then on Friday, I will be doing my workshop. And like I said, I think it'll be uh, divergences and confirmations. I think that's what I will be doing it on. Um, I'll pull out some some of my study materials and see what I can find to get uh, to get everybody else uh, up to speed and and give myself a refresher as I study for my level three CMT. <laughs> so yeah, that sounds like a, a project right there. <laughs> Absolutely. So that yeah. should be interesting. Yeah, no doubt about it. And as we get ready to wrap up the show, I mean, the S&P 500, by the way, I just want to mention sitting at 2653, the 20 day moving average is 2655. So mm -hmm. we got as high as 2662. We're doing just like we've done the last three days at this point. Anyway, our highs are right up there threatening that 20 day moving average. What the market could really use is a good afternoon and try to break out. But we'll see whether or not that happens later today. Indeed. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for being with us today. Uh, please remember to complete the survey as you exit underneath the uh, chat box. You'll see how we do. If you could uh, go in there, it's just a very brief survey. We'd love to know what you uh, thought of the show, what you thought of uh, Bill Shelby's tips uh, on how to use stock charts. Um, I think those are always great uh, segments. Uh, as a quick reminder, Market Watchers Live airs five days a week, Mondays through Fridays from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Have a great Tuesday afternoon, everybody, and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Happy trading.